The minor prophets are called the minor prophets not because they are unimportant, but because the books that they wrote are so much shorter than the books of the major prophets. Um, in your Bible, and in most Protestant and Catholic Bibles, the minor prophets appear at the end of the Old Testament in this order. Now you notice by looking at the dates that they're not in chronological order strictly, although they are roughly. They do kind of go from earlier to later, but not in strict chronological order. Um, probably Jonah is the oldest of all of these books, and Malachi certainly the youngest. Uh, most of the minor prophets did their work during the early Assyrian period, and um, some of them uh, at the late Assyrian period. Um, the um, uh, early prophets predated the Babylonian captivity. The later prophets followed it. So um, how do you make sense of it? Well, they all have a common theme. They all were prophesying at a time when Israel was departing from God. Israel was forgetting where they had come from. Israel was rebellious and was dabbling with paganism and spiritualism, um, immorality of various kinds. Uh, there was political turmoil. Um, great nations uh, were rising in empires and pressuring the smaller nations, of which Israel was certainly one. And um, um, there were also um, there were also a long way from their roots. It had been um, hundreds of years since uh, there had been a good king. Uh, it had been um, hundreds more years since the time of the Exodus, and um, Israel had in many ways forgotten uh, who they were, who their God was. Um, they lusted after the exciting gods of the other pagan tribes around them, the pagan nations around them. And of course, always, um, you know, God, Yahweh, the God of Israel was... Um, not a real fun god in many ways. You know, I mean, the the other gods they got to have, uh, they got their followers got to have uh, orgies, you know, and and God was always kind of strict about sexual fidelity and stuff like that. So, um, all of these minor prophets were trying hard to bring Israel back to its first love, back to the standard of God's perfection and holiness and uh, telling people that they were going to get into trouble one way or the other by departing from God. Um, and those themes kind of run through all of this. And, uh, but interestingly enough, it's not all doom and gloom. There are lots of statements in here about how God loves his people and about how he is faithful to them and about he, how he bears with them and how he's going to restore them someday and how great things will be again. And um, um, those are things that people can hang on to in any age. Uh, the top of the list, for example, Hosea, uh, a guy who was told to marry a prostitute and who did. And uh, predictably, she betrayed him. And God said, go after her, bring her back, love her again, forgive her. And this was kind of an enacted parable about how Israel was a prostitute that was constantly going off and playing the harlot and uh, defying God and how God still loved her and went back and brought her back again and again and again. Um, Jonah's story, you know, the story of Jonah being swallowed by the whale. Well, the whole point was that God wanted Jonah to go to Nineveh, which was one of the Assyrian cities, and prophesy that Nineveh was going to be destroyed on account of its wickedness. But uh, Jonah didn't want to go because, as he says to God, I know you, I'll go prophesy, and then the people will repent, and you'll have mercy on them and compassion, and then what I prophesied won't come true, and I'll look silly, so I'm running away. And, you know, that was the whole point of his getting on the ship and trying to escape, which God brought him back uh, in an unusual mode of transport. Um, 
And, and sure enough, you know, Nineveh did repent, and uh, there was a reprieve when Nineveh turned to God, but later on again turned away. Um, you know, so many of these stories are calls to repentance, promises of God's love, promises of forgiveness, uh, promises about how great things will someday be if uh, the people will just return to God and love him. Uh, Malachi kind of wraps the whole thing up uh, just a few hundred years before the birth of the Messiah, the birth of Christ, and um, uh, closes the Old Testament canon with his call to people to return to faithfulness to God and uh, experience a revival. And if they will, he promises, if they will return to God, God will be faithful and will return to them. So um, they're well worth reading, and uh, sometimes you can be put off by the imagery and the narrative, but uh, you kind of step back and you see what they're trying to do, and it all makes sense. Um, these 12 minor prophets, as I said, close the Old Testament, and uh, then there's about a 400-year gap of silence between the close of the Old Testament and the opening of the New Testament. Um, during that period of time, of course, there was a lot going on. Um, Israel was uh, conquered by the Persians and then by the Greeks and then by the Romans. And there were times of persecution and mayhem and all kinds of uh, places where people wondered where God was. Um, they were eventful centuries, uh, all of which created a deep longing in the hearts of the people for the Messiah and um, a desire to return to God. One of the interesting things that came out of this period of time is the rise of the Pharisees of the New Testament. These were people who learned the lesson that departing from God is bad news. And so they said, we are going to return to God and we are going to be so faithful to God that he will never be able to find fault with us. We're going to keep all of his laws. We're going to be scrupulous about our religious duties. And we are going to like, you know, out holy, holy. And uh, the very name Pharisees probably means the separated ones. They separated themselves from everything wicked, but they also separated themselves from a lot of their brothers and sisters in an effort to be really holy uh, so that they would not repeat the terrible disasters that had come upon Israel during this period of time. Um, there's a lot of other stuff in here that helps us to understand uh, various things about what happened to Israel and how some of the ideas evolved that's, that come to fruition in the first century. And uh, so, as I say, this whole time period is well worth studying, but people often kind of skip over it. When's the last time you read Habakkuk or Zechariah? Um, when's the last time somebody asked you to even find one of those? Um, I hope you will. Take a look. Um, well worth it.